Mr. Ford, I'm, I'll probably get the pronunciation wrong, but I believe your real name is Sean O'Feen, is it, or Fine? How, how Irish are you? Are you 100% Irish? Oh, such is bad. O'Fana. O'Fana. Sean O'Fana. Mm -hmm. When did you come to America? I was born here. What sort of a childhood did you have? Were you interested in movies way back? Not really. Not interested in them now, actually. It's a way of making a living. No, uh... Oh, I don't know. Occasionally you go to movies and, uh... I was not particular. I wasn't what you call a aficionado or anything like that. I was were they hard times, or were you reasonably? Mm -hmm. Were they hard times, or were you reasonably well to do as a family? Uh, hard times where? But what sort of childhood did you have? Were you poor or well to do? My father, you mean? Yeah. We were comfortably well off. You know, we were born on a farm in uh, Maine. He had a big farm there, and he was a farmer and a fisherman, just as he was in Galway, Ireland. And. Uh, we ate better then than we do now. No, we were, you know, we would say, you know, we are comfortable, lower middle class family, as you would say in England. <laughs> How did you get your start in the motion picture business? And tell me about the film The Scrapper. I beg your pardon? How did you get your start in motion pictures? And, and could you tell me about the film called The Scrapper? Well, I don't know. I was, I think it was in 1919. It was after World War I, I know, and uh, uh, they had an actor named Harry Carey, who they were about to let go. His contract was running out in four weeks, but they uh, wanted to do a picture, a couple of two reelers with him, and uh, so Carl Lemley, who liked me very much. I was, at that time, I as an assistant director, suggested that I do these. So we went out and made a picture called, I think the Three Godfathers. And they cut it and came out in five reels and they showed it to him and uh, he said, that's very good, and said, release it. And they said, oh, no, no, this is a two-reeler. We can't release a carry picture in five reels. This is a two-reeler. And he said, well, if I go to a tailor for a suit of clothes and he throws in an extra pair of pants, what do I do, throw the pants back? <laughs> he said, that's a good picture. So it, when I was a five reeler, it, uh, matter of fact, it, uh, the picture did very, very well. And uh, so he did another one and they re-signed Carey and then we had a change of management. I was getting $50 a week, so as a director, they cut me to 35 I don't know why. <laughs> and that was it. What was your other question? Well, can you tell me about the film called The Scrapper? I don't remember it. You played in it, and I have a review. I have a synopsis of the day. Can I read you the synopsis? I'd rather you wouldn't. <laughs> if I, I'd, I'd like to remind you, please. It says... I, I remember vaguely it was a stunt picture. Yeah. I used to double my brother in all his stunts. I was just fresh from a uh, varsity football team and was in pretty good shape. And all the stunts, we looked very much alike, I, I uh, <coughs> doubled for them. And they wanted to make a very cheap, very cheap picture. And uh, so they asked me to play the lead. There was no acting, and it was all stunts, I mean. Right. Running at 40 miles an hour and hang, get, catching uh, an express train and jumping horses off cliffs and that sort of thing. Yes, your and name. I fortunately came through with uh, no accidents, but uh, I don't remember much about the picture. It says Buck the Scrapper loses his girl no, who, not really, not really. who goes to the city. Well, no, you were I called. You were called about it. Buck the Scrapper. <laughs> I would like to forget about it. Okay. I prefer that they turn on to the BBC musical, isn't it? The musical hour. That's right. Uh-huh. Can you give me a, 
uh, a flavour or what you remember most about filmmaking in 1917 and 18? Was it really as primitive as everybody suggests? Well, I hardly think that primitive is the right word. In those days, I mean, we had no lights and we had a big stage, just, just a board. And over that, we stretched uh, cambric, a cam uh, cotton, to hold the light off. And there'd be five or six uh, companies working side by side. And uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, it wasn't, we didn't think it was primitive. We thought it was very, rather nice. It was fun. We all knew one another and visited back and forth. And uh, we exchanged actors and we'd go over and say, do you mind coming over and playing a butler for us? Well, not a butler. We didn't use butlers in those days. They were mostly Westerns. And uh, uh, it was all very lovely. And Hollywood then, or what it's called, geographically called Hollywood, a place that none of us can define. We don't know where it is. But I mean, everybody says Hollywood. I mean, for example, this is not Hollywood. And I don't believe there is uh, any studios in Hollywood, but uh, it's just a mass of orange groves. Sorry. Well, while from Manchester, I both of you know all about the Battle of Lewes, and don't the you? The Battle of Lewes, right? Yeah. That's strange for an Englishman. I may know anything about English history. <laughs> I thought it was only us Irish that knew about English history. <laughs> The Iron Horse remains one of the most epic silent westerns ever made. Were you interested in westerns before this, or was it this that fired your imagination? Well, when I left school, I went to college and I didn't like it. I looked at my curriculum, and this was stuff I'd had in what we call high, what we call high school, or grammar school. And I said, why waste my time learning this stuff? And I didn't like, particularly like college life, so I left and worked my way west and I punched cows for a while. I uh, worked in Arizona as a cowboy and eventually ended up in Hollywood. But, uh, did you ask me why I liked the West? Or was, it, was it this film particularly that started your tremendous interest in the West? Or had you been interested many years before? You have to rephrase a question, I mean, I don't... Well, this was your first really big Western. Here that doesn't work for BBC, <laughs> <to rephrase. laughs> this, was, this was your first really big Western. Yes. Had you always been interested in the West before that, or was it this that set you off on the Western kick? Not particularly. I'm not interested in the West. I you know. I'd like to make Western pictures because I'd like the people that I work with. I'd like to get in location. I'd like to leave this place with the small <coughs> smog and fog and traffic and uh, what do you call them? Speedways, freeways and I like to get out, you know, and live in the open. You work hard, you get up early, you work late, you eat dinner with an appetite, you sleep well. But I do like the people you meet and that you work with. And that is really my only interest in Westerns. As story material, I, uh, I'm not particularly fascinated by them. I mean, it's not my mess here by any amount of means. None of my so-called better pictures are Westerns, and uh, uh, for some reason or other, I'm sort of described as a Western director. But I was born and brought up in the state of Maine, of Irish parentage. I think uh, I think this is true because one of uh one of my favorites of your films is uh, Prisoner of Shark Island, which is uh, certainly not a Western. But it, it, it's a very interesting piece of Americana. W what interested you in that particular story? 
No, nothing. Just a job to do. I was under contract. They told me to do it, so I did it. it, it I like it. the story of Dr. Mudd, and of course, a great admirer of Mr. Lincoln, and well, I rather like the whole idea of the thing. It's one of your more ignored movies. Most, uh, it doesn't crop up in a lot of the books about you, and yet I think it's a very fine film. And yet people talk endlessly about the informer and stagecoach. Um, does this amuse you or irritate you? About Shark Island? Yes, and some of your lesser known films, which I think are just as good. Well, uh, it doesn't annoy me. I've never read anything about myself. I don't read magazines or picture magazines or I know in France, for example, I mean, they've written five or six books, the Danes have written a book and... Sorry, sorry, out of film. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's the one thing like that. Oh, that's a little... In the desert? A little picture of getting less than... Oh, less than three weeks. It wasn't supposed to be a big picture, it was just a B picture. And it was very interesting. We had a lot of fun. We were down in the desert. And we got up at 6 o'clock and started working at 7 because of the sun. From 11 on until 2 or 2.30, it would be impossible to work out there in that heat. And uh, I remember we had a, uh, one of the first of the so-called producers was on this picture. He was a nice fellow. He was a good friend of mine. And, uh, I didn't mind him, but we had a very difficult shot as where the uh, British cavalry was supposed to come into the rescue, and it was very hard. They had to ride way around, you know, so they wouldn't mark up the sand and get in a certain position. And uh, we finally got in position, and uh, the commander of the troop was our expert, our technical expert, an ex-major in the uh, Australian night horse, or should I say night horse, and uh, Australian night horse. <laughs> and uh, he was all set, and I gave him the thing to start to come on, and this airplane flew over their heads, and of course the horses scattered. And they finally landed this little satellite airfield we had, and this idiot producer got out with a big cigar and said, you know, and I said, well, you son of a, you know, you know, you know. and of course it spoiled the shot for that day and we had to wait until the next day. So, uh, he said to me, Jack, I've been looking over your schedule, pardon me, schedule, and uh, he said, you work at, start working at seven, and then you quit at 11 and start working from 2.30 till 3. He said, now look at those hours you're losing. Now, if you work right on through, you'd finish five or six days ahead. And I said, uh, Cliff, I said, you can't work in the seat. He says, he says, it's wonderful. I love it. He says, this is great. He says, I mean, why? Why? What the heat that doesn't bother you? I'm, I'm enjoying it. The heat, you know, he said, I feel you don't boom. I said, I'm sorry, I've got to line this shot up again that you spoiled, you know, see? And he wanted away, and uh, we finally get the shot, and I says, uh, <clears throat> where is Mr. So-and-so? I'd like to talk to him. He says, Mr. So-and-so? I said, yes, the so-called producer that flew in last night. And I said, I said, we've just taken him to the hospital with sunstroke. <laughs> I'm afraid that I roared with laughter, with great glee. <laughs> oh, great story. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ford, it is... Oh, poor fellow, i never forget. He was the most worldly guy. I went out to the hospital and looked at him. He's pale and worn. He says, hello, Jack. <laughs> so worldly gone, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. In between making a lot of uh, A pictures, you turned out scores and scores of, of what is termed in England, at any rate, B pictures. I don't know really what the phrase means, but anyway, that's what they call them. W was this 
bread and butter work, or, what, or were you all the while broadening your experience? Now, I think one trouble of the director in this country, and I think, you know, uh, one of the trouble of directors and universally is, they'll make a big picture, make probably a hit, and then they try to top it, eh? and usually fall flat on their face. It happens here a lot, and I know it happens with you. So I try to make it a rule, if you make a big picture, which is a hit, the next one do a cheap picture, relax, I mean three or four weeks, eh? while you're preparing for a, uh, another story. And usually, of course, I mean to my mind, the little picture is always better. See, my favorite picture, for example, is one you've never heard of called The Sun Shines Bright. Have you? Great. Huh? Judge Billy Priest. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, that's my favorite picture. The Republic. That's right. Great. Well, we just made The uh, Quiet Man, which is a big hit. So I wanted to change, you know, sort of just for, uh, do something else. And we did this thing. I loved it. We had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, so that's why. But some people keep on trying to top themselves when well, you can't. Sure. You return again and again to the small town American Southern scene with films like Judge Priest, Steamboat Round the Bend, The Sun Shines Bright. What is your particular fascination with the Southern scene? I don't know. My instinct. I married to a Southerner. Matter of fact, there is a grandfather's flag, Confederate flag there. It's still one of the few things left over from the war between the states. Uh, oh, I don't know. It just, hap just happens. I have no particular love for the South or any more than I have for the West. I'm still a state of Maine. But you've got it on the screen like no other de director ever has. Well, I don't know. It's probably my instinct or, some, or luck or whatever you wish to call it. I wouldn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't give you a lucid answer on that. Tell me how you managed to do that extraordinary steamboat race in Steamboat Round the Bend. Were those, uh, was that all real? Did you really have about uh, 15 steamboats? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Where did you find them all? On um, the Sacramento River, in California, Northern California. They were all up there. We just hired them and where they went. Though I'm sorry it brought up because they changed the company just about then. I had left a new producer, a new producing organization came to take over the company and they they cut the picture to pieces. They cut most of the comedy out. It was a very funny picture, but this fellow had no sense of humor, and all the comedy was cut out. And he tried to make a dramatic picture out of it, which it wasn't. It was a, it was comedy, pure and simple. The lassoing of the preacher off the, uh, off the riverboat Come landing. Right. I suspect that a lot of your scripts are very improvised, and I believe that one of the arch exponents of this was Will Rogers. Can you tell me about him? Would you make a statement and ask a, ask a question? A lot of my scripts are improvised. Exactly what do you mean by that? That you start with basic material and then work around it. Well, I think... Any good director would do that. I mean, a script is a skeleton that you work on. If it's a good script, you do it, I mean, verbatim. But how often do you get a script that you can do verbatim? I mean, I remember once upon a time, I mean, the so-called producer and the writer was a very dear friend of mine. He says, this is the greatest script I've ever written. He said, Jack, I want you to promise me now that you'll do this word for word. I said, I solemnly swear I will do it word for word. So I did this script and did this picture. We only went five weeks over schedule. And it came out when the final first cut was 18 reels. And, uh, you know, well, of course, 
I said, I did it verbatim. Every word in the script is in there. Eh? They were the longest speeches. Eh? Speeches, one speech, I know, read four pages. Eh? But I did it word for word, word for word, and I had to do it over and over again because it's almost impossible, you know, for a person, I mean, to, you know, memorize that. And, but I didn't run 18 reels, and they, they said, how are you going to cut it down? I said, I'm not going to cut it down. You're going to cut it down. I just directed and did it exactly the way you wanted. And I said, there was your picture. It was a horrible picture. And when it finally came out of them, and they finally did get it down to eight reels, it was horrible. Will Rogers obviously uh, got around this. H how did he work? Meaning what? I believe that Will Rogers had his... to have sort of a language barrier here. I believe Will Rogers had his own way of, uh, of approaching a script. No, that isn't true because he never approached a script in his life. I don't think he ever saw one. I mean, you get there in the morning and say, Will, this is what you're supposed to say words of this effect, and he'd read it, memorize, and well, the times, now he would say it in his own words, and they were much better than what the writer wrote, because nobody could write for Will Rogers, because Will Rogers has more humor than all the writers in the world, and he'd just say it in his own way, which was all, you know, which was good, and you never bothered, just let him go along, and, uh, Leave him alone. But as far as you know, he, he'd never, he'd never read and study a script word for word and try to repeat it. I just take it and say it in your own words, and he would. And it always came out right because he's a very, very humorous man. But he was always wonderful to work with because he was full of of uh, suggestion. It would be all right here if I said so. I said, great. Go ahead, say it. Well, he, was, he was a delight to work with. He was just a delight to work with. Are you growing a mustache? Hmm? I'm trying. I'm trying to. <laughs> Ex-guardsman? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Stagecoach was the first time you went out to Monument Valley, and you subsequently went out, I believe, many times. What was your fascination with this particular location? Well, I don't know. That's rather a peculiar remark. I knew about this, and I said, someday I hope to up there and make a picture. And the chap that ran the, oh, you the trading post, Harry Goulding, and I'd been up there, I used to stay with him occasionally, he says, you know, the Navajos are starving. He says, I understand you're going to do a western. Is If you come up there and do it, he says, you probably, you'll be doing them a great thing and probably save a lot of lives and uh, it'll certainly be a great help. And I says, I've always wanted and uh, always wanted to do a picture up there. And I went to Walter Waynes, who had owned the company, and said, I told him about this place. He says, go ahead, do it. And we went up there, and I think we left four or five thousand, hundred thousand dollars there. And uh, this put these people on their feet. We paid each one of them. I mean, a man that rode a horse and provided his own horse, got ten dollars a day. The women got five dollars a day, and the children got three dollars a day. So, I mean, it actually put them on their feet, and they appreciated it. And if nobody else, if anybody else tries to come in there, they object. They don't want anybody in there but me. I've been up, you say many times, that which is not quite true. I've been up there several times. Of course, many times. That's you're from Manchester. Manchester. Well, that's typical Manchester exaggeration. I mean, that's probably where that cuckoo came from, Manchester. 
I've been, I've been up there. I've been up there several times. But I love to work up there. It's a nice place. And as far as I'm getting the best in stagecoach, I don't quite agree with you. I think you've done it better in other pictures. But I'm on their, I am an, I am an honorary chief. I'm on their board of, uh, on the Indian board. And they have a name for me, a novel name. And over the years, I mean, since I've been up there, I've picked up, I can, I'm not fluent, but I can talk to them in Navajo. What is your name in India? Well, it's one I don't like, Natani Nez. means tall soldier. And I'm not a soldier, I'm a Navy man. And I object to it very strongly, but they have no word for sailor. So, I let it go. You can see these pictures around the wall. You don't see any army people. They're all Navy. Natani Nez, tall soldier. And uh, even if I go up there on vacation, they come in from the hills and they all gather and sort of reception. I'd have to kiss all the babies as if I were running for office in Bermondsey. <laughs> Incidentally, how did the elections come out? I mean, the... Uh, the local elections. The local elections. Ah? Uh, well, they were a disaster for Labour. They were a disaster for the Labour government. What? Well, you naturally, I mean, being a picture business, you're all socialites, you're Labourites. Mm. You know, a very funny story. I was in, in England. I always used the same driver. His name is Hoskins. And he was an ex sergeant major of the uh, Black Watch. And he always drives me, wonderful driver. And we were out, we went out across the river. I wanted to see the uh, St. George's Inn or something where Shakespeare, they used to put on the Shakespearean plays in the courtyard. What is it called? George Inn Southwark. Huh? George Inn Southwark. That's it, yeah. Southwark. We went out there and had lunch, and I wanted to see it and look at it. And in driving back, I said to the two lordlings, I says, uh, uh, how do you boys vote when you go to the House of Lords? And they says, oh, socialist, you know, that's the thing to do, you know. Uh, that's it, you know, you're the smart thing to do, a socialist. And I said, oh, yes, yes, socialist. Maybe socialist, yes. So I asked Mr. Oskins, you know, I says, Oskins, how do you vote? He says, conservative, sir, good old Winnie. <laughs> and uh, they looked at him as a bride, and they started to laugh, and he says, Hoskins, you've just got two more conservative votes. <laughs> oh, that's the thing you're doing. It's a small thing, you know, later. Mm -hmm. To return to movies, however briefly, because all you're saying is fascinating. Wow. Well, just tell me, tell me about Don't your... you want to talk about English politics? It's fascinating, yeah, if you want to. No, it is, I don't know. <laughs> Tell is Frank Packingham still in uh, politics? Frank Packingham? Not to my knowledge. I don't think so. No. No. We have Enoch Powell, though. Hmm? We have, we have Mr. Enoch Powell. He's just put the cat among the pigeons. Who? Mr. Enoch Powell. I don't know him. Ah. Out of Packingham. Oh, that's right. He's, he's in the House of Lords now, anyway. His brother died. He's now the Earl of Longford. But I imagine he's still... He's... Uh, He's socialist. He's, uh, he's a professional politician. Mm. Go ahead. You want to talk about movies, not politics. <laughs> Can you tell me about your lifelong association with John Wayne and how you first met, please? A late afternoon. Oh, well, the sound is on. We better not continue that part of the conversation. Okay. Go ahead. You were talking about John Wayne and my lifelong association with him. How did you first strike up your lifelong association with John Wayne? Well, number one is not lifelong. Uh, I've known Duke about, Duke as we call him, about 30 years. He was my third assistant prop man. Then he became the second prop man. He finally worked himself up to prop man. And we started to do stagecoach, and, uh, oh, everybody turned it down. I had to peddle it around. 
And finally, Walter Wayne said, you know, he says, well, you got to pick. He says, you know, said, what, the Western Union? He said, well, go ahead and do it. He said, he says, who do you want to use for a lead? I says, I've got a kid here. He's uh, just out of college. I've used him in several bits, and he's very good. Big, tall, handsome guy. And I'd like to make a test of him, uh, test of him uh, show it to you. He says, well, if you say he's okay, you go ahead and you. I'll make the test. So I made a test of him. He says, yeah, he says, go ahead, great. And so Walter went off to Europe, and we made the picture with Duke, and that sort of started him off. But uh, we've always been very friendly, and uh, I'm the godfather of all, of all of his children, and he has many, and his grandchildren, of which he has more, so, we're very close. Can you tell me about the incredible story of your filming of the Battle of the Midway? What is incredible about it? You running out there with a camera under, under direct attack. I did what? That you were taking shots yourself and directing shots while the place was literally under, part of the place was under attack. And they ran a flag up. A Marine ran out and actually ran a flag up, the American flag, while the place was literally being blasted to hell. Well, that's what I was getting paid for. There's nothing extraordinary about that. Now, I was on this tower to report you know, to the uh, officers who were 50, 50 feet under the ground, exactly, I mean, the position of the Japanese planes and the numbers and so forth and so on. And uh, meanwhile, I had a little 16 millimeter camera. I had one boy with me, but I, uh, says, you're too young to get killed, so I hid him away, I thought, in a safe place. And uh, so, uh, I just kept reporting the different things. I said, there's a plane out there. All our planes shot down, manned the parachute. The Japs have shot the parachute. He may have landed, and the PT ball went out, you know. And uh, I just reported the different things and took the picture. I don't think nothing. Should. I was getting paid for it. That's what I was in the Navy for. What else could you do? Well, a lot of people would have run like hell. I can tell you what they would have done. Oh, I don't think so. And I was doing all right until I had a blast of shrapnel that knocked me. It really, I had wounded pretty badly there. But however, I managed to come too long enough to finish the job. And there's nothing extraordinary about it. I mean, it's uh, what you're getting paid for. You've worked with a lot of old timers, people like Tom Mix, Hoot Gibson, and even William S. Hart. No, I never worked with William S. Hart. He was a very dear friend. I've never, I never worked with him. Hmm. Were they a different uh, breed of cowboy from your Joel McRae's and your, uh, your uh, Gary Cooper's? Well, that's a pretty difficult question to an ask, or to answer, rather. Well, I don't know. I never considered Joel McRae, I mean, a cowboy, and Gary Cooper's certainly not a cowboy, although he was born in Wyoming and probably brought up on a ranch, and Joel became a cowboy, I mean, in pictures. But uh, they're all the same, they're just playing their parts. They're actors, and they're supposed to be versatile, and they were. But I, I, and I couldn't make any differentiation between them. You know. All I know, they're all nice people. <laughs> Yet, do you see, though, the, the systematic destruction of the Indian, the Red Indian, as something inevitable or a blot on American history? Hmm. Somebody translate that for me. What do you say? 
Do you think that the destruction... What did that sailor? What did he, what did he ask me? Do you think the killing of the Redskins, the extermination of the Redskins? Huh? What about, he was asking you about the destruction of the Redskins. Do you see it as a blot on American history? Destruction of what? Of the Redskins, of the, the Indians. The American Indians. Do you see it as a blot on American history? Well, Cheyenne Autumn was, was just about the most eloquent, moving film I've ever seen on the subject of the poor goddamn Indian who was cheated out of all his land, his hunting I mean, ground. that's a political question. I don't think it has anything to do with pictures. I'd, uh, you know, I would, I would, all I could say was no comment. I don't know. I wasn't alive then. I had nothing to do with it. My sympathy is all with the Indians. I mean, any more than the invasion of the black and tans into Ireland. Do you consider that a blot on English history? Hmm? Do you remember that in 21? Mm -hmm. Well, I, being Irish, it's my prerogative to, ask, to answer a question with a question. Do you consider that a blot on English history? I think some historians would, as I think some historians would regard the, the systematic destruction of the Indian as something terrible. No, I'm not talking about the Indians, I'm talking about the black and tans. I don't know enough about it. Mm. Same thing, Everybody, all countries do the same thing. I mean, there's like this fellow named Hitler doing it, Stalin. Genocide seems to be a commonplace thing in our lives. But it was not a systematic destruction of the Indians. However, that's politics. And that has nothing to do with pictures. I'd rather, I would rather not discuss it any more than I... As long as you won't answer my question about the black and tans in Ireland, I, I won't answer your question about the Indians. Okay, Pax. All I know, Pax. All I know is the cavalry got the hell kicked out of him. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and the Indians practically destroyed themselves. It was the loss of the buffalo herds that wiped them out. There's a story that on the film Wee Willie Winkie, after the death in the film of Victor McClaglin, you quite spontaneously suggested that they include a funeral scene. Can you tell me how that happened? Well, we went out there, and it was raining. And I says, I know, I've been to India, and it rains like the dickens there. I said, let's do it in the rain. The cameraman agreed, we had lights there, so we did it in the rain, that's all. I said, let's put it in the funeral. I said, it's a mistake. I said, it's a mistake in the story to kill McGlaglin off. He's one of the leading characters. But at least if he's going to kill him off, I mean, let's give him a funeral. But it was in the rain. I said, so let's shoot it in the rain, which we did. And that's all. It took. Just in order to fill in the day's work. It amazes me, though, that you, c you can work so spontaneously. How did you... Uh how did you organize it? How did I what? Organize it. It looks like a sequence that would have taken a week to shoot, and instead you tell me you did it in a day. Oh, no, we didn't do it in a day. Nothing of the sort. We did it in about an hour and a quarter. Let's put it down to Irish instinct. <laughs> okay. Would you say you were hard on your actors, or do you get to your results with kindness and friendship? Well, the only way I can answer that is that everybody that I've ever worked with is always anxious to come back and work with me again. I am not hard on actors. I can always realize an actor's capability. Sorry, I should, sorry, sorry. Uh, what were we talking? Actors, and how you work with them. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, they're human beings. So I say, all I know is that anybody's ever worked with me, they're always anxious to come back and work with me again. I never stand behind the camera and yell directions. I go up and I speak to each actor individually, so the vulture, so the others don't hear, and everything is thoroughly rehearsed, and I try to get the first take. And uh, they say directors being hard on actors, those directors don't usually last very long in pictures. I've known of several that were hard on actors, but uh, they've gone with the wind. How do your English directors? I mean, David Lean is very nice on actors, isn't he? Very. Hmm? Very. Really? David's a very good friend of mine, incidentally. I was sorry to hear about Tony Asquith. Dad. Hmm. What happened to him? Heart? He'd been ill for some time. He'd been ailing for a long time. And he, uh, as well as directing, he was also president of the English Union, of the I Film Union, that, as yes. you know. And I, he but really... I'm a member of the English Union. He made me an honorary member of it, yes. Mm -hmm. And he ri literally did work himself into the ground. Mm. His death was very, very keenly felt in England. He was a wonderful fellow. I was very fond of him. Mm. Great visual sense. His movies were always great. Got to look his at. brother has the title, hasn't he? He has an older brother who has the title. The Earl of Asquith. Earl of Asquith and Oxford. That's right. Don't you know any English history? All I know is movies. Oh. Now, I bet you've never been out to lose. <laughs> and you come from Manchester. Speaking of England, or well, it was not of England, but I happen to be looking at that cookery over there. It's a funny story connected with that. Would you care to hear it? Very much. It applies to England. Ah. I had my group in Burma. We were up forward in the forest. It is a mix, mostly naval, but we had marines and soldiers. And we hired a lot of Gurkhas, Nepalese, who were too old. I mean, for the present war, they were all rated men. Matter of fact, uh, the commander was a Havildar major. And of course, they were furious, you know, but they were, you know, their sons were in the war, and they weren't. And uh, they did a terrific job for us. I mean, they were great soldiers. And they were great jungle fighters. And as I was leaving, they presented me with this kukri. And the Havilland Major said it was the first one that's ever been presented to a... non-Nepalese. This is very, very interesting. That is a uh, is that the chief's cookery. Uh, very, very special. I don't little knives here and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm very proud of that. I consider it a great honor. And boy, how they could use them. You've got some great mementos in this room. Are you a memento collector? And I what? A memento collector. I am not. Are you really interested in the past at all? In the what? The past. The past. The past? The past. Oh. The past. Not the past. It's the past. The past. Or meaning in the past. Or the past. Oh. Am I interested? Or certainly. I majored in history and I'm very much interested. Mostly in English history. Naturally, in order to lick them, I mean, you've got to know them. But, uh, <laughs> certainly I'm interested in them. But these things, I'm not a collector, they just happen to gather through the years. I mean, all these fellows over there, there's some famous people there. 
I mean, all the admirals, every admiral up there is a four-star admiral. There's my old board boss, Wild, General Wild Bill Donovan, most decorated man of World War II, one. And the gentleman of the khaki uniform is Admiral Johnny Bulkley, the most decorated man in World War II. It's just coincidentally side by side. But of course, Bill's pictures from World War I, they're all, all four saw. I don't know what that is over there. That's a little picture. Oh, that's, that's General Dove and I just before we jumped in behind the lines in Burma getting ready to make this stupid jump, which came off, however. It was all right. And I don't know. They're all mementos, they're all things, you know, you gather over the years. I mean, I never, I, I myself am not a collector, and uh, people give you things. There was a saddle, I mean, speaking of being mean to actors, there is a saddle that's worth, oh, I would imagine a few thousand dollars, that Mexican saddle. Is there any chance to pan over and see it? Get a shot of it later. Pardon me? I'll get a shot of it later. Yeah. And that, pre that was presented to me by the cowboys and the stuntmen after a picture. And it was a very, very valuable item. A Mexican saddle, you know. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I'm afraid you're going to hate this question, but I, I do want to ask you about courage. Would you say that courage was something that one acquired or something that one was born with? Well, how do you expect me to answer that? Because your work, your films, are full of courageous people, your activities in the war are full of courage, and you've chronicled some of the most historically courageous incidents in history. You do seem to be interested in courage. I don't know. I've tried to figure it out. I am a... I am really a coward. I know I am, so that's why I did foolish things. And I was decorated eight or nine times, trying to prove that I was not a coward. But after it's all over, I still knew that I still know that I was a coward. I've always found out the little quiet little man that nobody pays any attention to usually has more guts. Can you use guts from BBC? Hmm? Sure, has more guts and courage than the big blowhard, the big noisy, you know, the big outspoken fellow. It's a little man that does the courageous thing. Courage is the thing that does not belong to any nation, you know, any class of people. I mean, for example, I mean, we, uh, People laughed at the Italian army. But among our medals of honor, first, of course, the Irish, and second, the Italians, third, Mexican-Americans, and fourth, Anglo-Saxons. I mean, something that occurs is something, I don't know, it's pretty, pretty hard to find. Look in the dictionary and of three dictionaries, you find three different def definitions of courage. I wouldn't know. All I know is that I'm not courageous. Oh, you go ahead and do a thing, but I mean, after it's all over, your knees start shaking. <laughs> if you don't believe me, look at that. There's some, something out there where my wife has all my medals. I didn't put them there, she did. <laughs> Medals so for so-called gallantry in action. So-called because I was not gallant or anything else. It just happened that way. Your films often depict bloodshed and violence. 
and yet I get the feeling that you hate violence. C can you explain this? I do. And my pictures do not always show violence. Very, very few of them do. And if they do show violence, it's over very quickly. I suggest it more than anything else. I never show a long sequence, I mean, with violence. I do it quickly, or I do it by suggestion. I hate violence in pictures just as much as I do these sex and incest and all the things that are going on now. Sometimes the story calls for it, and I have to do it. But I have to deny you when you say that my pictures, I mean, show a lot of violence. I do not. Okay. Okay. Mr. Ford, would you tell me about that magnificent saddle there? Mm. Well, tell me first, are you enjoying your mild and bitter? It is absolutely marvellous. Thank you. It's almost as bad as English beer, isn't it? Not quite. Huh? Not quite. <laughs> Not quite? Not quite as bad. There's one thing we have in common. England and the United States. We make the worst beer in the world. This is this is ginger beer. For the sake of my uh, image, image, my oh. audience, not for my image, my people back home. Go ahead. What about the, what about the saddle? Oh, that's uh, that is a Mexican parade saddle. It's worth many, many hundreds of dollars. And they're very, very expensive. It was given to me by the cowboys and stuntmen at the finish of the picture. And there's a tremendous amount of silver on it. And it's a very, very beautiful thing. I personally would never use it. I'd never ride a horse on it. Would it? Uh, I use the McClellan saddle. That's the army saddle. And... Uh, but here in California, you see them at parades and things. It's, uh, I think, the what they call a charro saddle. And, and, and it's, it's a wonderful gift, but uh, it's just there as a decoration. I mean, God, I'd never put it on a poor horse. It's probably break his back. But it is a lovely thing. Now, what were we talking about before the last commercial? <laughs> I'd like to ask you this. You've given me a very good example this afternoon of your, your wit, your ability as a storyteller and a raconteur. Some people who I've spoken to about you said that you were a bit eccentric, but a very nice guy. A bit eccentric? Yes. How, how do you see yourself? Do you think you mean when I shave in the morning? <laughs> I shudder with horror. A bit eccentric. I wouldn't know how to define it. I know what you mean by eccentric. How am I eccentric? In what way? I don't know. This, one or two people have said what a, what a great sense of humor you had and that you were a great wit and that you love telling jokes, which I think we've, we've seen great evidence of here this afternoon. But eccentric, and what? I don't know what you mean by eccentric. Everybody has a little eccentricity in their character, I believe. But uh, if you ask me to define it, I don't know in what way I'm eccentric. Probably because I'm very courteous to my equals, more than courteous to my inferiors. I'm speaking in terms of pictures, and I'm horribly rude to my superiors, so-called. So that's probably what they mean by eccentric. You enjoy verbal wit, though. Not much. I don't get out much. Uh, the late Sir Winston, uh, would you call him an eccentric? 
Yes, I knew his private secretary, believe it or not. And she Which said... Which one? I know several of them. Which one? Oh, we're not supposed to mention names and these. I knew several of them. They all asked him, would you like to come in and see Mr. Churchill? I said, hell no. He's a busy man. We're fighting a war. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What did the, pri the private secretary that you know, what did she say? Oh, she told us amusing stories of how he would do dictation wearing only his underpants. How she's what? How he would do, how he would dictate letters wearing only his underpants and make a brief apology and say, I'm sorry, I haven't had time to dress. Please excuse my informality. Oh, that's uh, Sir Winston. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Well, one of them told me about uh, him dictating a very, very important letter wrapped in a, wrapped in a huge towel, smoking a huge cigar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was a great man. One of the greatest. Speaking of India, he was part Indian too, wasn't he? What? No? I don't know. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> you shook your head in horror. I don't know. Oh, yes, Bobby? he's 16th Seneca. I'm sorry, Mr. Ford. As an American, you'll have to tell me about uh, Winston Churchill. <laughs> well, he is half American, you know. His mother was American, wasn't she? Yes. Yes. And one of the family, I think you're about 18th Seneca. That doesn't mean that the Senecas are highly educated, highly cultured uh, tribe in New York, part of the Iroquois. And he was always very proud of it. Mm -hmm. Do you think the early settlers would have been proud of the America we have today? What does that got to do with films? <laughs> because a lot of people, for right or wrong, regard you as one of the foremost, if not the foremost, chronicler of American history. Hence the question? Hence the question. Well, right now I think they'd be bloody well ashamed of us. <laughs> yeah, all right. Just a question, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, times change. I mean, we're in a state, state of turmoil. Here we act different from you, I mean. Here, if an admiral loses a battle, they throw him out. Your admirals, if they lose a battle, they kick him out, in the, they kick him upstairs in the House of Lords. You know, it's just a, so I think uh, times have changed. You can't compare. It's not a fair question. You can't compare those times with these times. I mean, it's uh, this is supposed to be an Anglo-Saxon civilization, but uh, actually, the percentage of the percentage of Anglo-Saxons are a small minority. I mean, they're people of mother country. What aspects of American society dismay you most? What aspect of American society is what? Dismay you most. Is what? Dismay you. Dismays me? Well, in the first place, to use the word society is a bad word in this country. We have no so-called society. We have no class distinctions. But uh, if you speak well, I'm worried about these riots, these students. I'm worried about this anti-racism. Uh, they can blame out the poor Negro. It isn't the Negro that's doing it. They're being influenced from outside, from some other country, they're agents. 
And the people that are doing these things, I mean, that are being arrested, they find out that more than half, I mean, are not nationalized citizens and are Caucasian. And the poor Negro is getting the blame. And I worry about all these things. So that's why I think that our ancestors would be, can you say uh, B L O D Y? You can. I think they'd be bloody well ashamed of us, yes, if they saw us now. But things will get better. Things will get better. I heard, it may not be true, but I heard that certainly for screenings in New York of some of your films that dealt with the Negro problem, that they were cutting sequences that they believed showed Negroes in subservient attitudes or positions. I don't believe that I've seen a single film of yours that ever did this, but I believe it is true that they are cutting sequences that show Negroes in Inferior. I've never made a picture with a Negro in a menial capacity. The only picture I made of Negroes, and they were heroes, that was the, uh, I think they call it the Black Sergeant over there, Sergeant Rutledge, which was a big hit abroad, I mean, France and in England, I mean. Uh, France and in Spain and uh, Italy. I don't know how it did in England, but, uh, so that, couldn't possibly be true because I would never show a Negro. Cut it out, Phil. Sorry. Right. Stop. Mm -hmm. The Bovril. Was it Bovril? Bovril. Bovril. Ah, I caught you out at last. Damn. At last I caught you out. The word, Mr. Ford, is Bovril. I'll be saying Charles Mondeley next. <laughs> Charles Mondeley, yes. <laughs> I'll be saying Niagara Falls. You you say Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. Yeah, we we say nipples. Nipples. Yes. Go ahead. What about the? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. The story is that certainly in screenings in New York of a lot of films that contain sequences showing Negroes, they consider the racial problem so hot, so precarious over here, that at the moment... Are you referring to my films? I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Now, repeat. What you were saying before the Bob Rule commercial, I was at Pliers. <laughs> Pliers, yes, pliers. Or as we'd say in Manchester, players cigarettes. Yes. Cigarettes. Now, what, uh, you were, you, uh, go ahead, you were saying that yes. they, in New York they were cutting out... They were cutting out sequences that showed Negroes in subservient or menial positions. Yes. Now, as a maker of films, which included a lot of Negroes, how do you feel about this? Are you, you referring to my films? Well, I don't think, I think you're mistaken. I have never shown, I would never show a Negro in a menial capacity unless you are playing a good part, a part that is either comedy or drama. And the only picture that, the only real film that I made was uh, Sergeant Rutgers, in which they were all Negroes. And they certainly were played in a heroic light. So I don't think referring to my pictures. Now, whether or not they may be cutting out uh, sequences in New York uh, where you show uh, Negro in a menial capacity, I don't know. If you're asking my opinion on I have no comment. I don't know. Because heavens knows what they do in New York. I mean... I mean, they're liable to do anything because, I mean, once it gets to New York, God help us. I mean, all hope abandon he who went to here. I mean, they should have put, that should be the motto of the city. So I don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't give you a plausible or a lucid answer on that. Because I very seldom, 
when I say we'll use Negroes except in a good part. Somebody described Hollywood to me as a neon wasteland. Do you think it's a pleasant city or a vulgar city? It's, according to where, uh, number one, where is Hollywood? Eh? You can't refer to Hollywood as a city. We don't know where it is. I mean, you asked me to go to Hollywood, and I, I said, well, where is it? Nobody lives, none of the picture people live in Hollywood. There are no studios there. In the old days, we had one that is the old, the original Universal, and that was in a grove of orange trees. <coughs> and somebody called it Hollywood for the simple reason that no holly grew there. And uh, so now, now sort of a general term for the film industry, but we don't know where it is. So get back to your question and say, uh, and say Los Angeles. Ask it again. I mean, it's, uh, before we get into another commercial. Do you think Los Angeles is a pleasant city? Or do you think it is, as somebody described it to me, a neon wasteland? Well, I don't think that's very clever or very smart. Or I don't know what part of uh, Los, Angeles, Los Angeles he was in. There are parts of Los Angeles that are beautiful. Uh, there are slums there. There are nice homes. And you can't call this district a uh, wasteland. And you certainly don't see any neon lights around, except that damn thing that's blinding me. Uh, but you are privileged. As a matter of fact, I think we have less neon lights in Los Angeles than any other city in the country. It's just a bad, I think it's a, a stupid remark by somebody. And with all due deference to you, I think it's stupid of you to ask. Continue with the next question. What about Watts, districts like Watts in Los Angeles that seem, as far as one can gather, to have a very big problem at the moment? A district what? Called Watts. Well, that has nothing to do with films, has it? No. That's political. Okay. That's racism. I, gave, I expressed my opinion, I think, kind of while the uh, machine wasn't running. Okay. But it wasn't the Negroes that were doing this. There were mostly whites, and those that they arrested, a large minority, were, did not, were not uh, nationals. But they blamed it on the Negroes. And then the young kids got in and started raising the Dickens, but uh, and it wasn't nearly as bad as described in the news media. I went through it, it's nothing like it, nothing like that at all. However, that's a political, social problem, and it's nothing to do with films. The next thing you're going to ask me, I mean, who's going to be the next president of the United States? I mean. And then I'll in turn ask you, who's going to be the next king of England? <coughs> that's something you've got to look forward to. Difficult question, but would you say you were an optimist or a pessimist? Neither. It's a job of work. It's a nice, easy way of making a living. Easy? Yes. Movie making easy? Yes. Well, you're the first person I've ever spoken to who said that. As we say, if I may drop into the vernacular, it's a piece of pie. It's simple. I've retired for a year. I've never worked so hard in all my life. I worked from morning until night. Fortunately, today is Saturday. I go to that office, and there's scripts, and there's letters, and there's phone calls from New York, and London, and Paris, and all, all over. And I work like a dog. The result is that I'm going to 
retire from retirement. I'm going back to work to get for a vacation. Now, making films, I mean, it's fun. It's not hard work. You can make it hard work if you want to. I know people that go crazy. I mean, you know, that's trying to make a film. I always thought it was a lot of fun. I never, you know, I never cared that much. I never cared that much. I mean, they hand you a script and I uh, read it and turn it back and I say, all right, I'm under contract. I'm supposed to make it. It's a lousy picture and it's going to make a, it's a lousy story and it's going to make a lousy picture. But if you want me to do it, they say, well, it's already booked. Do you mind? I said, I'll do the best I can with it. And it always turns out bad. But I'm neither a pessimist or an optimist. It's just a job of work. Like the man digging the ditch. He looks at the ground and he says, I hope the ground is soft so that my pick will dig deeper. What We're getting stuck for questions, I mean. I think we'd better quit, I mean. What is your next movie going to be? Can I ask? Well, yeah, later in the year, I'm going to do a story of the OSS story about General Wild Bill Donovan. He was my boss in World War II. In World War I, he was the colonel of the Fighting Irish, which was our leading shock regiment. And he was the head of OSS, Officer Strategic Service. That's sort of like your SOE. As a matter of fact, we worked very close with SOE. And on his death that I promised I would make a film about it. So we're working on it now, preparing the script and things, and uh, towards the end of the year, I'll start working on it. And that will be it. John Paul, thank you very much indeed for speaking to him. And I hope this doesn't put BBC back a hundred years. Got it. <laughs> All right, well.